Hi, my name is Patrick Birch. I'm a, a GP and I'm uh, in the final year of a PhD funded by this institute. And um, my PhD is looking at uh, continuity of care in a fragmented primary care system. And the reason that I wanted to do this, this uh, PhD was because I've seen the effects of um, patients being seen by multiple different primary care providers and the kind of disharmony and, and disjointed nature of some of this care that's provided. And I feel that we, you know, we can do this better. So to start with, I'm just going to talk to you about continuity. What is continuity? And it can be thought of in a simple way, just seeing the same clinician. But when you're being seen by um, different clinicians and different providers, um, then it's more than that. And I use this definition given by Haggerty et al, which is continuity is the degree to which a series of discrete health events is experienced as coherent and connected and consistent with the patient's medical needs and personal context. And, and I put a figure over here, which just explains some of the elements that go to make up continuity um, as envisaged by Haggerty. And um, so at the bottom of this, um, this, this figure, you have relational continuity, which is seeing the same clinician. To the left hand, the circle on the left hand side is informational continuity. So having access to clinical notes and, and medical information. The, uh, the circle on the right hand side, management continuity, is the idea that um, care is uh, joined up and linked with care that's gone before and care that goes afterwards. And I've added to this co coordination mechanisms because when patients are being seen by multiple clinicians or different providers, there needs to be some coordination between them. Now, down the side of the, this, this figure, you can see that sometimes patients are, are aware of these elements. So a patient knows if they've got a relationship with a clinician, but they may not be aware of some of the coordination mechanisms that, that go on in the background. So what did I do? Well, I did two case studies of extended access providers. Now, for those of you that don't know what extended access is, it's a service that's been available um, since 2018 to all um, GP patients in England, and essentially offers uh, routine appointments um, in the evenings and at weekends. And the way this usually works is there will be a central um, provider of appointments. So a patient will ring their, up their GP, they'll book an appointment, and the GP surgery will book an appointment in at this extent, this, this central centralized provider. And multiple different practices will book in at the same provider. I used an inductive approach. Um, I did constant comparison analysis. And this enabled, enabled me to create a model of the factors that affect the potential for patients to experience seamless care. So the model. The, there are three main factors that affect the potential of patients to experience continuity. And they are the patient, the healthcare system, and the clinician. I'm just going to touch on the patient and the healthcare system, uh, and I'm going to talk mainly about the clinician, mainly because it's the, the, the least research aspect of these, these things. Patients, it's fairly obvious, I guess, if you have a patient that's more complex, more complex health needs, it's going to be harder to experience continuity. And the healthcare system, there are multiple elements, the appointment system, the, the type of coordination mechanisms in place that are important. I should point out, of course, that these things are, are, don't exist in isolation. So the patient interacts with the clinician, with the healthcare system, they all interact with one another. And I will touch on that in the results. So the clinician, what influences the clinician's behaviour and their ability to provide seamless care for a patient? Well, my work found there were four principal things, really. There's clinical knowledge. So you can't treat a patient's condition if you don't, haven't got the knowledge to do that. Uh, but at the same time, there's also system knowledge. So you may have great clinical knowledge, but you don't know what local services are available. You don't know, as a clinician, um, how to link in with those services or coordinate. There is the patient, there, there's the clinician's attitude towards risk. So, for instance, if you have a patient come in that may need admission to hospital, but equally you could potentially monitor them at home, it's a bit of a grey area, which way do you go with that? Now that will be influenced partly by your clinical knowledge, your knowledge of the system, and also um, uh, system factors as well. Um, but there is, it is individual to, the, to each, each clinician. And then finally, you have the clinician's view of their role. What do they think that they're doing in that role? I'm coming on to that in the next slide. And role performance is a concept that's um, talked about in the sociological literature. So it's the idea that people behave differently depending on who is present and how they perceive the role. 
And the question, of course, then is, well, how do the clinicians with extended access see their role? And I think there are several questions that clinicians, when I spoke to them, would answer slightly differently and have different thoughts on. And these are questions such as, who should we be treating? You know, it, should this be a service just for acute non-complex patients, for instance? Uh, am I here to provide a safe one-off encounter or is it my job to provide ongoing seamless care to patients? Am I trying to create a relationship with this patient? And uh, Is it my role to coordinate care for this patient? And this is just a quote from one of the uh, nurse practitioners who works in extended access who I interviewed. And we were discussing who should take responsibility for coordinating care between extended access hubs and general practice. And she said, I would do it on an, on an individual basis because I do think that patients have to take onus of their own health. And I do want to promote that they've got to be proactive and sort things out for themselves because sometimes patients will, well, they'll let you do everything for them. And uh, that, that is a sort of a, a view that was commonly held by the clinicians that worked in the services at both case study sites. But the question then is, you know, how do you pick that individual basis? And different clinicians will, will, will do that differently. How does it manifest itself? So how does this, the idea that clinicians behave differently and perform continuity differently, how does that manifest itself? Well, it manifests itself in two ways. There are ways that are visible to the patient and the ways that are not visible to the patient. So it, it, one way that is often visible to the patient is uh, where the clinician has read the notes either in front of the patient or before they've come in. They may ask a patient to coordinate their own care or they may coordinate it for them. They may arrange follow-up with them personally within the service if possible, or they may say, well, actually, no, you need to go back to your GP for that. So that's, that's fairly obvious. In ways that aren't visible to the patients, sometimes a clinician can read notes before consultation and be aware of patients' issues, but the patient doesn't know that they've done that. It's not always obvious to patients where the clinicians are taking on board responsibility and risk because they can dress up what they do as being quite reasonable, being the right course of action, where actually there are multiple different acceptable courses of action and they've potentially taken the, the easier one. Likewise, I've put here that you can clinicians can do non-productive investigations and treatments that may seem reasonable to a, to, to a patient. So for instance, I um, witnessed one clinician we had a patient who had come in with um, an issue that had been going on for some time. They'd had some blood tests done six weeks, weeks previously by their own GP. And the clinician said, well, I'm going to do a few additional blood tests uh, and then we'll send, uh, they'll, they'll go back to your GP and we can move things forward. Whereas actually, as a clinician, I know that those blood tests were very unlikely to do anything in addition. And it could be seen as a kind of holding measure or, if you like, way of fobbing off the patient and getting, them, getting someone else to deal with the problem. Likewise, I witnessed treatments that were unlikely to be successful and almost certainly were going to need follow-up by the GP. But again, this wouldn't necessarily be visible to, to the patient or obvious. They may look like the, the clinician was providing good joined-up care. There was also the, the element that cl clinicians sometimes blame the system. So clinicians may say, well, I can't do that because the IT doesn't let me do it. And actually, it was difficult to do the IT, but they had used workarounds in, in other circumstances. But again, the, the patient wouldn't know that. And so, so what? So, so, so why is this important? Well, from the point of view of system design, I think there's an assumption sometimes in, in policy circles that if there is IT in place, then and there are access to clinical notes, then any clinician in any circumstance can deliver joined up seamless care. I think what my work shows is, well, that this, this just isn't the case. I think we need to make uh, the ability to coordinate between different services easier for clinicians so that they do it. Um, and where services are providing similar, um, similar, um, similar services, um, you know, for instance, generalised primary care, then there needs to be clear responsibilities and roles for the service and for the clinicians within those services. In terms of research, well, these findings need validating in other settings. Um, I think there's a valid question as to whose job is it the patients, is it the um, clinicians, whose job is, co is it to coordinate care? And I think the difference that we've shown that exists between different clinicians warrants further explanation. Uh, and, and ultimately, you know, the reason that I did this PhD, that we, we you know, we are providing um, seamless care to, to a lot of patients in a sort of fragmented system. 
I think what this what, what my work shows is that there are elements that we can change and that are obvious um, and we can ultimately do things better. Thank you.